Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Dezine, and welcome to day four of Dezine 15, a digital festival celebrating Dezine's 15th birthday. We asked 15 creatives from around the world to come up with ideas for how to change the world over the next 15 years. Over the coming days, they'll all be presenting their manifestos for a better world. Today, we're speaking to architects Stella Mutegi and Kabagi Karanja of Nairobi Practice Cave Bureau. Hi, Stella. Hi, Kabagi. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi, Marcus. Hello. Dizzy. How are you doing? How are you doing? Good, good. So Thank you. How are you? First of all, tell us a little bit about yourselves and Cave Bureau. What is it? What do you do? Where are you based? Tell us all about it. Okay. Um, we're a traditional architectural firm. So um, when we're not doing what we're doing here today, which is the research and spelunking um, going into caves, we're busy yelling at contractors and uh, engineers um, on site. But then unlike a traditional um, architectural firm, we also do quite a bit of research and our research has been done largely in caves here in Kenya. And what is the, what is the connection with caves? Why do you spend so, so much time researching caves? I guess for us, uh, caves really are sort of the root of architecture. And uh, beyond that, the first structure, uh, mankind and our homo sapiens species inhabited. And uh, if not consciously over the sort of centuries, if not millennia, transcended to become architecture as we know it. And, and it's a space we com connect back to in many ways for us, yeah. And does that research and does that experience of visiting caves transfer into your work or would you not be able to see any connection between the, the research and the, and the, the contractor yelling projects? Um, it does. It does to some extent. Um, there's things, quite a lot of things that we have learned from our time spent in caves and um, from that knowledge that we get um, from the caves, it, it sort of informs some of the projects we do and how we do them, how we design them. Um, so yes, I would say it does, it does um, inform our yelling part <laughs> to some point. And where are you speaking from at the moment? Is that your studio? And, and tell us where it is. Is it in the, the center of Nairobi? Tell us a little bit about your setup there. Yeah, so we're in Nairobi, uh, the capital city of Kenya. And we are based within the city center, so to speak, although on the slight outskirts in a place called Kilimani, uh, which is Swahili for on top of the hill. Um, and yeah, we have our small studio here where we, we make things and, and, and ponder over where, where this world is going or not going. <laughs> And in a second, I'm going to ask you to share your presentation, your, your manifesto for how you could change the world or how you could change at least Nairobi in the, the next 15 years. But I have to say, you've definitely so far been the most ambitious in, in terms of what you've presented to us. Everyone should go and have a look at the, the post with your manifesto because there's this amazing 12 minute film which explains the whole in depth uh, genesis of, of your idea. But do you want to share your screen now and talk us through your manifesto. Sure, thank you. Um, I believe you can hopefully see the presentation. Yeah, I can see it now, yeah. Well, to begin, um, we want to wish Divin a happy 15th birthday. And Thank you very much. We're extremely humbled to be here celebrating it with you, to share some of our thoughts um, straight from Nairobi, East Africa. So happy birthday, Zizi. Thank you very much. So the project we are presenting is titled the Anthropocene Museum 4.0. There are a number of iterations that have come and uh, this is the fourth installment, which is titled Masai Kau Corridor. And we, as mentioned, we are located in Kilimani, Nairobi. So it's a deep pleasure to be here. Um, I guess we've already introduced ourselves, but um, just a bit more information is that uh, Cave Bureau was formed in 
2014. And, you know, initially we started it out as a small design bureau, but um, over time, we sort of got interested in, in um, exploring caves, which we did and we have been doing and we will continue to do. Um, so far, we have looked at the Mbai caves, we've been to Suswa, we've been to Shimoni, and there's still very many others that um, are on our list uh, that we want to go have a look at. And within caves, um, we are very small. Both Kabage and I have worked in very large um, architectural firms. But, and because of that, we, we wanted to keep our practice very small. So we are never more than 10 people and we don't intend to ever go um, too big that we can't manage what we are doing at the cave and as well as do the research um, on the side. And everybody that comes through cave is also a part of the research. So they immerse themselves into that. So that's good that we've been able to influence even the people that come in um, and work with us. So as titled, it is the Anthropocene Museum 4.0, the Maasai Cow Corridor. And in a nutshell, if you call it, uh, we look at an architecture for an age of trauma, resistance, and healing, which has its roots in our deep past, of which we aim to go through. And the Anthropocene, for the very reason we are in this age, a troubled age of man, as it's disturbingly called, where we've impacted the world to such an extent that we are imprinting ourselves on strata of rock in oceans, in the air, atmosphere, visible through space. And what this means is we are effectively going to feature on the international chronostographic chart, which is a geological chart. And it's, if ratified, would find us quite squarely placed uh, in a troubling way, straight after the Holocene epoch. And this unfortunately has, has resulted in multiple effects, uh, more so with the increase in greenhouse gas emissions that have resulted in global warming as we know it. But looking at that fact, uh, it's important to realize that there is a colonial and imperial context to the Anthropocene. Um, the global south that took the brunt of it. Looking historically in the context of the expansive empires that plundered the world through slavery right through to colonialism, which in this chart expresses the very point where it is determined or expressed that uh, the Anthropocene begins at the great acceleration. And it's at that very moment and point where across developing worlds in the global south where there was immense resistance by freedom fighting movements that actually coincided with, with that. And naturally as well, thinking about the civil rights movements, many movements into the Black Lives Matter today as we see it, among many others that are directly, you would argue, as a result of anthropogenic effects, effects, should we say, on the world as we know it. And these were resisted deeply in time. And for us, at least historically, we look at the caves that were used as spaces of refuge and convening to consider the new African state of the future. So they are pieces of architectural history that we use multiple uh, academics like Franz Fanon, Amitabh Ghosh, Edward Said, Leslie Loco, and the list goes on and on to determine and sort of show that territory in many ways Excuse me. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a dark history. And uh, along the East African coast, uh, more so, it's not really remembered or considered in the history books that there was slave trade along the East African coast. The West African slave trade is more written about, more acknowledged. And so being in East Africa, this was part of our heritage as well. And there are caves that specifically were used as slave holding chambers that we analyze. And with all the caves we look at, we tend to analyze the context uh, of them architecturally and in history. So the museum part of the Anthropocene Museum for us as well is very contentious as museums were literally the vessel to either store plundered 
artifacts from Africa, to name only a few continents, but we should add that. And so the museums were expressions of that deep, dark history. And we use it uh, in this project to, to question uh, that deep past. And with the current narrative of returning artifacts back to Africa, uh, there is a need to reconsider what this institution is in the first place, more so in the African continent. And one of the things that um, we also find out as we go through these caves um, is even what is um, happening around the environment. And this is an image of um, geothermal activity going on um, in Naivasha. Naivasha is about, let's say, 60, 60 kilometers from Nairobi. And while we were at the Sutwa Caves, uh, which is another 40 or so kilometers from Naivasha, um, the effects of the geothermal um, exploration was felt um, that far, far away. And one of the things the community told us there is that um, one of the people we spoke to, a man called Ishmael, who grew up around Sutwa, would tell us that there's many uh, species of animals that used to be around Sutwa that are not there anymore because of what's happening um, with the geothermal. Uh, the effects on the climate, the effects of, um, on the people because where the government takes land to, to explore this green energy, people are displaced um, in, from places where they have called their homes for centuries. So in as much as you know, we are trying to be green, um, we also ask the question, how, what is the effect of, of going green sometimes? So this is something we, we unearthed while just um, talking to the people in Susua. So within our manifesto, we broke it down into chapters. And these are a few cues for you to look at when considering what our manifesto is about. And fundamentally, as people who love caves and are looking at the history of caves, we have developed something called the cave canon, which fundamentally looks at revisiting the history of architecture and uh, the capacity to look at that deep time experience of mankind into these spaces of heritage, where you imagine the first experience of an echo, first experience of a light world, all really impacting with uh, our experience of architecture today. And this is just one uh, three-dimensionally scanned cave, Mumbai cave, in the outskirts of Nairobi. And this we manifested or effectively transposed into Venice uh, at the 17th International Architecture Exhibition, where we were housed in the Galileo Chini Dome, and we transposed stones within um, that dome space. And it was a space of Congress, as mentioned before. And we hung these obsidian rocks at the exact point cloud positions of the cave. And the idea was that we would use this space, a space of dialogue, as we've done with many communities, as Stella highlighted. And we aimed to do that in Venice, but unfortunately, the pandemic uh, did not allow that. So as, as highlighted, we believe with that African gaze on the Anthropocene and in many respects, the global uh, South's perspective, I think all things are open for questioning and more so the history of architecture. If you look at the recent installment of Sir Bannister Fletcher's Global History of Architecture, when you look at how far back are we looking at architecture, and our decolonial activities within caves worthy of placing within the history of architecture. And uh, we challenged naturally as this new installment of the, of the history of architecture in this book, it challenges the old version. Uh, we again also uh, critique the new uh, edition, the 21st edition of this history of architecture um, to quite critically look at how we describe that deep past in the current situation. And then the, the other chapter is um, what is 
actually this um, Antil 15 4.0, which is the Maasai Health Corridor, where we're imagining a new decolonial infrastructure of healing. And we look far back into history, way back um, to early man and, and, um, and what, what early man uh, saw, what they experienced, what, how they lived, and then use that through, through the years to, to look at where we are now and how that's affecting us, what has changed and how do we move forward from that. And uh, in many respects, we, we look at obviously the, the history of animal husbandry, which dates back even before the pyramids, way beyond 10,000 years ago. And if you look at Nairobi as a city form, its name is, is derived from the Maasai word that translates to the place of cool waters. So it was ancestral land. And what we have today is a situation where the Maasai have been deeply displaced and uh, it's flashed over the media. There was a tension in New York Times of the sort of crisis of this situation of, of such elegant people and people with deep knowledge and being able to think what, what could be the future um, for the, the first inhabitants of Nairobi city uh, that the city is named after. And the reality right now is they're sort of flung to the edges of reserve roads where their cows eat garbage along with grass, not distinguishing that, where they're harassed by uh, traffic and really trying to consider as, as an architectural studio in Nairobi, this scale of a problem almost appears to be beyond our capacities. And um, this led us to these two ladies, uh, Dorcas Satine and um, Emily Letech. And they live in a place called Birika. Birika is about um, 40 or so kilometers from the city center of Nairobi. And they, they remember nostalgically um, when they were younger, how they would roam with their cattle and their goats and sheep. And they would roam freely because um, they had large, chunk, large chunks of land um, that belonged to them that they found um, belonged to their ancestors before, many generations before them. But now with um, urbanization and people moving around a lot, we have found that um, they don't have that land anymore. They don't have that land anymore. So they are forced into small pieces of land because people have bought land and they have um, put on the top um, because it is, it's now privately owned. So they are left with small small uh, chunks of land where they graze their cattle. They used to have large um, herds of cattle that has had to reduce because obviously they don't have as much land. And then apart from the land also, um, climate change has affected them greatly. Before they didn't necessarily have to move too far away to graze their cattle. But now um, this prolonged drought seasons, and they have to walk really far distances um, through people's land sometimes if they find that they're not yet fenced. And even when we met with them um, looking for their cattle, they kept, they kept telling us they're just here, but we walked and walked almost a whole day looking for them. And that's really an, an effect of what climate change uh, means to these people. So, Another section of our manifesto is what we call a reverse futurism in terms of how we look back in time, being able to chart ways into the sort of precarious world that we're living in, of a world in complete climate crisis, and being able to search for, for moments and places where we can look for restorative artifices, as we call them, within the landscapes of Phantasmagoria and Nairobi. And what we mean by that is being able to look back in time to, to answer the huge challenges of, of the present. And that's translated at least with our work in mapping the city, um, looking at the riverways, which obviously are homage to the history of this city as the place of cool waters. 
And there is obviously evidence of, of that history, which is now under complete stress. And the conventional infrastructure that intersects with that, from the airport in red, Jomo Kenyatta, to the railway in purple, and the main arteries into the city. But in a way, looking in reverse at, at these infrastructures as potentially um, green spaces, spaces that can be interlinked and using the logic of migration routes of the Maasai and how they traverse to the city. And in a way for us questioning what these pieces of infrastructure can be today or in the next 15 years as quite attainable. And so as, as large as the proposition is to look for uh, an infrastructure for the Maasai to traverse within the city, um, we, we consider multiple spaces as highlighted the airport reserve land, um, where there was a proposed greenfield airport, which fell flat on its face. And so there's these vast tracts of land that are empty and, and not serving uh, anyone, as well as railway reserves. So we, we conceive of these um, uh, vestiges and small spaces within, within the city that can be used, but more so considering um, it as, as a bona fide piece of infrastructure alongside the current conventional, should we say traditional infrastructure. And for us being able to craft that using our knowledge of caves and transposition of, of different caves, and in this specifically the Shimoni slave caves, which we transpose and use in one-to-one, -one, but begin to flip and look at their opportunity to, to store rainwater. And um, then this would be spaces that um, even tourists coming into Nairobi would be able to come and um, enjoy the wildlife that we have right within um, Nairobi city, but also a place where the Maasai can um, come back to their old ancient um, migratory um, spaces where they brought their cattle from millennia before their ancestors before. It's a space they can now comfortably come, get green space, get uh, cool waters for their, for their animals. And at the same time, um, develop an ecosystem um, that thrives for everybody. So as part of the proposition, architecturally speaking, these structures would house uh, multiple uses for the cows, like cattle dips, like um, salt licks, where they would lick the walls um, to get their dose of sodium chloride. Spaces of veterinary spaces where people could, uh, their, you know, the Maasai uh, can come and have their cows checked. But also market spaces, as Stella had highlighted, mm -hmm. to consider a space of commerce between these, uh, these vestiges of, of a, far, uh, a past cave, which is the Shimoni slave cave. And beyond that, we believe um, it, it behoves us to look at the current infrastructure where our government, uh, for their own obvious reasons to alleviate traffic, are creating vessels that would actually exacerbate more traffic in the city. And being able to consider at least in part if these um, infrastructures over a period of time could be actually adopted to be cow corridors but beyond that, spaces where people could cycle and walk and where the historic landscapes could now return back in the city to reinvigorate very current issues in urbanization where it's more pleasant to walk in, pleasant to be and to stay, and where even animals can eventually start to creep in. So reversing the tide of, 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 um, of our current um, endless a pursuit for a modernism or a space of contemporaneous, which unfortunately is leading us to, to, to do in the last. So to conclude, we, we have proposed another institution beyond the uh, Anthropocene Museum, which is BRIT, which Stella can produce. And uh, BRIT um, stands for the Benevolent Reparations Institute. Um, it's an institute conceived by faith um, 
and it's it's an institute that looks to creatively attract the return of uh, wealth of the people of Africa and indeed the global south. And the way we look at doing it um, is not necessarily, you know, many people, um, for instance, the, uh, the African World Reparations and Repatriation Truth Commission, um, and also the academic Daniel Tete Osabukule have strong figures of what that might be. But for us, we think that it should be public um, installations or projects such as the Cow Corridor that bring back, um, talk about what has been done to the community, um, talk about the issues because of what has been done in the past, and then a way of looking forward towards healing rather than placing um, an amount. And because when we place an amount, we also would wonder who are we giving that amount to? Because the people that suffered this are long gone. Um, and we are now generations later, but um, we acknowledge that atrocities were done, but uh, we find a way to, to get communities around Africa, all the 54 nations of Africa, um, get communities where we get um, committees of people who are like-minded and they vet, they vet these projects such as the Cow Corridor in the various um, countries. And in that way, fund um, those projects as a way of um, repatriating that uh, stolen um, African heritage. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Um, so presumably you've spoken to the Maasai and other people, other members of the community about these projects. What is the feeling amongst the, the community, the particularly the, the original inhabitants of the city, about these kind of ideas? So this, this project is extremely fresh. Um, we, we developed it in conjunction with discussions we had with Dorcas and Emily, and as well as uh, to some extent Ishmael, to be the pressures in the city. Um, this presentation comes at the verge of when we want to open it up, not only to the private sector, but the public sector to, to gauge interest. We already know based on the sort of little research we've done that there's a huge need for it. And uh, we, we thought it would make sense to use the design platform as a way to open up the conversation and opportunity to, to mold this project as, as it seemed fit, because it's extremely complex, but uh, potentially really rewarding for, for the community. I think a lot of people in the West, when you think about the Maasai, you imagine these kind of noble tribes people on the plains with their cattle, is, is that all gone? Are there still some pockets where they can herd their animals in the traditional way or is it really uh, a kind of something from the past already? There is um, small pockets of land, but that is slowly uh, diminishing obviously because um, land, they used to own big chunks of land that were never even dedicated. They didn't have um, they didn't have title deeds for this land. It was always communal land. And of course, the Maasai are pastoralists. So they would move from place to place um, in search of greener pastures. So it's um, it's been downscaled quite a bit, um, but it's still there. If you were to come as a tourist, you'd still be able to see a bit of that, but um, not, not as it used to be. And it's actually getting worse because um, they, they are selling off their land. And of course, with education and um, commerce and urbanization, they are also living uh, the traditional way of life. And this phenomenon of the, of the Maasai coming into the cities with their cows, is that, has that been happening for a long time or is that a recent phenomenon because of the loss of the lands? Well, uh, it's relatively recent, but I think uh, straight through um, independence, um, if you consider as well um, the fact that they were displaced, displaced by the British administration uh, from their ancestral land and moved to these reserves, so to speak, which are today the game parks we know. I think post-independence and over time, that migration still will take place. 
um, albeit intermittently and where today it's, it's treated as, as a menace in the city. And so it's, it's interesting how it's, it's sort of evolved over time, over years. Um, but yeah, that's the state of it. It's, it's, it's very present right now. And you mentioned the, this is the fourth iteration of the Anthropocene Museum series. Tell us what the other ones were. What are the ones that came before this? Um, the one before 4.0, Anthropocene 3.0, is what we are currently exhibiting at the Venice Biennale. And um, that was, um, as Kabage had mentioned earlier in our presentation, was um, to transpose the Mbai caves to Venice. And the Mbai caves were, were used by the Mau Mau. It was a place where they sat and strategized um, how, how to counter the, the colonial government. So that was 3.0. Um, 2.0 we presented in New York. The, the, the world around. Sorry, the world around yeah. in January this year. And that was uh, Shimoni, uh, Shimoni Slave Cave. So in January of this year, we went to Kwale. Um, that's off the Indian Ocean um, coast in, of Kenya. And uh, there we, we, we realized that the Shimoni Slave Caves are under the National Museums of Kenya, obviously because of what happened there. They were slave holding caves. Um, used by the Portuguese and the Arabs, and of course the locals um, during the slave trade. And these were ca caves held for, the, they, they held the, the slaves as they waited for the ship to come down the coast, collect them and then take them down to, to Zanzibar. Uh, Zanzibar was the largest slave market um, at that time. And then when they got to Zanzibar, they were either taken to the plantations, the spice plantations in uh, Zanzibar, or they were taken to, um, to work the fields in, in the Middle East. And then the 2, 1.0. 1.0 was um, again also the Mbai Caves. And for this one, we had an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt and Smithsonian uh, Museum in New York as well as Cube Museum um, in, in the Netherlands. And with this one, this was the first one actually that has developed, that has led to all these other iterations. And with this one also, it was the Mbai Caves, the same ones we have um, at, Be at Venice, but obviously did it a bit differently. There we showcased the bronze model. So we 3D scanned the, the cave, then did a model out of that and um, cast it in bronze. Um, and that we use this as, as um, artifacts, we call them artifacts where we can hold conversations about, you know, what has happened, what is happening now and what we foresee um, in the future. Tell me a little bit more about this concept of reverse futurism, that's such a, a lovely term. It's it's also very fresh because um, at some point we, we kept getting um, called people locked in caves and you lost in time and not really looking ahead. And uh, we sort of disagreed with that because a lot of our work deals with the present conflicts and problems we a lot of communities are going through. And rooting them in the past is, is quite fundamental because it gives you a very broader look at, at the problem and allowing you architecturally to think about them in, in, in a sort of contemporary way, um, if you'd call it futuristic way or Afro-futurist Afro way, uh, being able to, to transcend these challenges of space and time and a history that's incredibly dark, but yet with moments of, of imagination to be explored. And I think for us, that's, that's the territory which we find ourselves very comfortable in and, and, and openly challenging the history of architecture in that pursuit. Yeah. You, sh you showed a series of pictures of what looked like a new road being built in Nairobi, and, and you mentioned that when you were talking. So is that what's happening? Are they going through the same mistakes that we went through <laughs> many years ago of just 
increasing road capacity and and hoping that that will lead to faster flowing traffic which of course then you get more cars on the road and everything gets worse is that is that highway being built now it is it It is. is There are sections already being opened up for more cars to come in <laughs> and create more traffic. And it's, it's an expressway uh, built uh, by the Chinese and um, told, told, should we say, in the sense that instead of the huge amount of loans that African states are taking up, we, we are paying for it through tolls. And so for three or oh, well, two pounds, you'll be able to cross from one side of the city to the next to the airport. So it's, it's very geared towards those with money. So the rest would sort of remain on the, on the ground floor, if you call it, uh, of the city. Um, so it's, it's very problematic and, and something we were happy to critique. And looking from Africa towards the, the COP26 climate conference that's going on in Glasgow at the moment, what are your feelings about that? Do you feel that, that pl- places like Kenya are being adequately represented and cared for in those talks? Well, we, we had our president there, um, President Uhuru Kenyatta, who, what was really interesting, at least quite um, uh, fascinating for us, at least, uh, is the fact that we hold quite a strong moral high ground when it comes to the, the green economy. Um, slightly over 90% of electricity consumption is from renewable sources, um, something that maybe a lot of people don't know. So as a so-called developing country, we are anticipating that by 2030, we will entirely be off grid or using green renewable energy. And so it's, it's a platform where I know for a fact general media have not uh, sung about. Um, we've come a long way as a country, um, but yet a, long, uh, a much more longer way to go with, with that. Um, but unfortunately, it seems like the, the conference uh, is very geared to the superpowers and, and the discourse that takes place between them, or at least maybe that's how the media presents it. That's what it's sounding like from, from where I'm sitting as well. But where is all this renewable, what is the source of this renewable power? Is it hydro schemes or solar? How do you generate so much um, renewable power in, in Kenya? Uh, yes, there's hydropower, um, geothermal. geothermal, as Stella had touched on, uh, which also features in our Anthropocene Museum 1.0, where we talk about the, um, the, the sort of uh, downsides and environmental degradation and uh, the community's displacement due to its, its, its uh, practice and extraction. And uh, geothermal is, is probably the biggest, one of the biggest, but hydroelectric as well. We have one of the biggest plants in Africa uh, for solar capture coming up in the northern part of Kenya. Um, so yes, it's, it's a mix of those key, should I say big three um, that provide that. And finally, in terms of this project, what are the next steps now for the the whole uh, Anthropocene Museum 4.0, the Corridor project? What are you going to do with it next? Uh, I was just wondering what would happen if um, the Minister for Transport here in Kenya saw (laughs) what we are proposing with his um, superhighway, expressway. But... um, I think, like Abage highlighted before, it's still very fresh um, in our minds and it's still in the infant stage. We still have a lot to do. We will be talking to a lot more people. We will be engaging the Maasai community a lot more. Um, We'll also be engaging stakeholders, like um, what we mentioned in our presentation. There's all this um, empty uh, pieces of land owned by corporations like the railway, the airport, that could be used to benefit the people of um, the Maasai people and their cattle. So there's still, I would say there's still a bit more work that needs to be done um, on the Anthropocene 4.0. Um, yeah, I don't know if Kabage wants to add on to that. Yeah, and, and hopefully, I think usually and which is why we concluded with BRIT, mm. the Benevolent Reparations Institute. Um, the main things that sort of caused a sort of uh, bypass 
um, in, in any project is the financing. And we, we thought it might make sense to, to create an avenue uh, to open up uh, finance uh, channeled through what is obviously the reparations route and not relying so much on the guilt of the global north, but relying on imagination to spur and inspire uh, the opportunity to fund, if you call it crowdfunding or whatever. So uh, we are also considering that as, as a key component to, to realize that vision, which as Stella highlights, will require multiple stakeholder engagements, but hopefully goodwill, because at the end of the day, it's such a dark history. People are currently suffering, and yet there are propositions that could create a much more livable city, a much more inspiring and, and green city, if you'd call it that, uh, or brown city, because we have a lot of savanna grass, which is most of the time very brown. <laughs> brown uh, but um, uh, yes, we, we hoped to, to look at all facets to, to realize it. And we have a 15 year timeline to, <laughs> to make it a reality. Yeah. <laughs> Well, best of luck with it. It's, it's in some ways a kind of fantastical project, but also really super pragmatic. It's just giving giving the land back to what was there before. It shouldn't really be that radical in some ways. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you so much for using our birthday party to get this idea off the ground. And best of luck with it. And great to see you. Thank you very Thank much you. for having us. Thank you, Marcus. Inviting us to your party. <laughs> we're really humble. You're very welcome. See you and soon. Thank you to the fantastic design team. Yes. You guys are excellent. And I'll, I'll be wrong to just, uh, without saying, a great thanks to the people who really supported us in this project, from Dan Sumaseti to Kome and our fantastic local team here, from Mtamu to Kevin, among many others. So thank you, design. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And it's good to, to the, the, the design video team are in the room with me now, Callum and Francesca. Did you hear that? You're getting a, a big <laughs> pass on the back. Thank you. And all nice of our birthday families, presents. Now, families who allowed us to stay up late, go all manner across the country, uh, we, we love and appreciate them. So thank you, Dizzy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.